Okay, Act 3, Scene 4. Banquo is dead. Fleance has escaped. And now Macbeth has to face the world with that on his conscience. Uh, it's a big party scene. Uh, we don't know really why, but I don't think it's an official thing for his first coming out as the king. I don't think that's the case. It's just a, it's just a banquet, where, a formal dinner where everyone has to get together. Um, it's the real first test of Macbeth's serpent uh, and flower skills, if you know what I mean. He's, we, we learned early on in the play, right from the very beginning, uh, we've been prepared for this. We, he, he's going to crack. He's going to crack in this scene. He can't stand up to public scrutiny, and we've been prepared for this right from the beginning. Lady Macbeth said at the beginning, your, your face, my thane, is as a book wherein men may read strange matters. So we're waiting for it. We're waiting for it to crack. She said it there. She said it a few times all throughout the, all throughout the, 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 the story. Now, if you remember uh, what I mentioned before about, um, about uh, there being minor, oh, of course I can't do this now, about there being these minor climaxes before we get to the big climax at the top, we get these little ones. Well, this, this is a certainly is, is the biggest of the littlest uh, of these micro climaxes. Interestingly, uh, I, I watched uh, Uncut Gems uh, over the weekend, and it, 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 the, it's the same thing. The storytelling techniques, it's the same. There's a devastating climax in that film. But there's all of these little micro climaxes where, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You, and you're following the, the, the tension, the rising tension all the way up. And, but, but you're prepared. You're prepared for that big bang by all of these. There's at least three or four of these instances where you're saying, okay, this is where, this is where, this is where it's going to happen. Um, but it doesn't because the, the, the filmmakers and the storytellers wait until the end. So this is one of the big things where, 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 where we're getting, we've been prepared for his, his, his breakdown. It's the famous scene. It's the ghost scene. Uh, um, I'm, give, I'm giving you spoilers here because I'm assuming you've actually watched the movie just once. You should have watched one of the versions of Macbeth once so you have an idea of what's going on. So you, you kind of know what's going on. Um, anyway, okay, so um, to know what's he saying here, you know our own degree. Sit down. Welcome, everyone. Hearty welcome. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go through all this. This is just the appearance versus reality. Flower and the serpent. Blah, blah, blah. We will mingle with you in a moment. Our hostess, Lady Macbeth, is here. Cheers, cheers to all. We, 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 you know, welcome, welcome, welcome. She says the same thing. Everyone is welcome. Now, the murderer appears at the, at the side door. So there's a stage, and the audience is down there. Macbeth is here, and, you know, he's giving all of the thanes are, are lined up or sitting down or going to take their seats at the big banquet table. And he sees, of course, over the corner of his eye, Macbeth sees the, the murderer. But he still says to everyone, um, do, 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 do. here I'll sit in the middle and I'll join uh, your your mirth. I'll join the happiness in a moment. I'll I'll give the toast. Then he steps aside and he looks at the murderer and he says, "There's blood." He talks to the murderer. Everyone else is mingling. The audience is watching. Everyone else just just having a, their party. And he says to the to the murderer, "There's blood on your face." And he says, "It's Banquo's." Well, it's better. It's better outside of your body than inside Banquo's body. So he's happy that Macbeth, that, that Banquo has been killed. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat is cut. I did that for him. So he's saying, yes, Banquo's dead. And so he's happy. And he says, thou art the best of the cutthroats. And you'd be the best of them all if Fleance were dead too. So you'd be, if thou didst it, thou art the non -parel. So you have no parallel. You have no equal. Now um, this this could be this could be taken. I mean, I've been going back and forth on Macbeth here. Are they morally? They're definitely morally aware, and I do believe they're moral. Or are they just brutal savages? This might be. You could take this as an argument uh, to suggest that he's no. He's he's concerned. He, he's pretty brutal. His friend is 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 murdered, and he's and he's being quite, you know, quite quite cruel in his assessment of the of the situation so you can use you know you, I, I don't you could argue you could argue either way and i think the film versions that we have i think i've said before some film versions take a hard line on macbeth his cruel ambition and you could twist it like that my favorite interpretation of it and i think shakespeare's text bears it out uh is that macbeth is weaker than he is savage on the battlefield we know he's a great warrior savage in that respect but in a good cause psychologically certainly not so not certain psychologically not as strong as he as he would like 
to be. Uh, most rural Sir Fleance's escape, so the murderer says Fleance got away. <clears throat> so this is more evidence that perhaps he's just cruel and perhaps he's just ambitious and perhaps he's just an awful person without that moral, strong moral core. We could argue that here. Fleance has got, gotten away. So as soon as he hears that Fleance has gotten away, that's when he has this fit. It's not when he hears that Banquo has been killed, his buddy has been killed. He doesn't have his fit when he realizes that, oh my God, I really did it. I really did kill my buddy. He has a fit when Fleance gets away, which is going to be a threat to him, of course. That's when he has that panic attack. Then comes my fit again. I had else been perfect. Before that, I was perfectly strong. Whole as the marble, founded as the rock, as broad and general as the casing air. So I was, I was my great noble man. I was my great noble king, general as the as wide and and powerful as as all of this. Before I heard that Fleance got away, but now I am cabined, cribbed, confined, bound in saucy doubts and fears. Um, that's how Shakespeare describes the mental illness of Hamlet. Uh, Hamlet says, I, "I could consider myself." Uh, king of all the world and bounded in a nutshell or something if except that I have bad dreams so there's the sense of the mental illness being something that that imprisons you uh, and he certainly is in, in prison which leads to the question that I ask about retro uh, um, uh, redemption is he redeemed has he suffered I have both of them suffered enough by this the mental prison that they're in you know, I don't know, probably not or in some ways perhaps uh, so then he tries to, to okay 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 Fleance has gotten away, but Bank was safe, right? Bank was dead, right? I, my good lord, he's in a he's in a ditch. Twenty gashes on his head, the least a death to nature. So every gash with it was a death death to nature. So nature, there's the nature versus the unnatural. Thanks for that. So some more serpent imagery comes in here. Some some and it's kind of ironic. He says there the grown serpent lies. So your teacher might want you to focus. Your teachers very often ask you to find metaphors and explain them and stuff like this. Well, here's one of them. There the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled hath nature that in time will breed venom. Will venom breed? No teeth for the present. So Banquo is the full-grown snake that can kill me. He's gone. Fine. The worm, the little snake. He's gotten away, and in, uh, he has a nature. He has a neat cause for revenge and, and the ability to do it because he's, he's of noble lineage, I suppose, from, from uh, Banquo, who's a, who's a good, strong man. Um, that in time, so eventually, Fleance is going to become a problem. He's going to have venom, but he, the, the snake is not a problem for now. Get thee gone tomorrow. We'll talk about this later on. Okay, so the murderer leaves. So now he's got this on his head. Um, let me just talk about this too first. So, so Banquo, Banquo and Fleance are described as the serpent and the worm. So there's irony there because of course who's the real serpent and we've seen that that image come up again and again. It's Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are the serpents. Um, I might be overthinking this a little bit. Uh, perhaps this is projection. Macbeth calls Banquo the serpent as a way to, he knows that he himself is the serpent because they've called themselves Lady Macbeth and has called them the, the serpent already. So Macbeth knows that he's the evil guy, but he projects that image onto someone else. Remember we talked about scapegoating in a previous video? There might be a bit of that here. I might be overthinking it, but well, it's the motif, right? So th this is this is a re this is a connection to that serpent motif. And and with the scapegoating is, is a motif that runs throughout the whole play. So maybe... Um, or maybe a bit of overthinking here. Macbeth projects his own corruption onto his enemies. My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. So Lady Macbeth realizes that, okay, it's time, dude, 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 you got to play the game. Come on over here. You do not give the cheer. The feast is sold that is not often vouched while tis a making. Tis given the welcome. Okay, so this is kind of convoluted, old-fashioned, weird language. Basically what she's saying is that... Um, you at home when we're when we're dining casually at home, you don't have to worry about formalities. You don't have to worry about giving the toast. But when we're out in public and we're doing uh, we're, we're doing a feast properly, you have to come and you have to give the welcome. You have to give the toast. So come on over. And she's in Macbeth, of course, puts on the smile and says, "Oh, of course, thanks for reminding me. I was I was lost in something else." And he gives the toast. Good digestion, weight, and appetite, and health on both. Yay! And everyone gives the gives the gives the cheer. So Lennox says, one of the one of the thanes says, uh, mayest please your highness sit. He says, come on, sir, sit down and join us. The ghost enters, the ghost of Banquo enters. Of course, it is the 
and sits in Macbeth's place. Now, it's significant that the ghost sits in Macbeth's place, of course, because it echoes back to the borrowed robes theme. Macbeth knows the king's seat is not his. Banquo is more suited, and Macbeth knows this. So psychologically, of course, the ghost is a projection of Macbeth's own psychology, his own guilt, and it sits in the place where Macbeth should be, and he knows that, and that he, he Macbeth knows that he doesn't deserve that seat. He, Macbeth knows that probably Macbeth, Banquo is the better man, because he said before that Banquo is a better man than I am. Perhaps Banquo deserves the kingship more, and the witches have promised that seat to Banquo's sons. So there's many reasons why Banquo should take Macbeth's chair. Um, so Macbeth looks, he, he doesn't quite recognize the ghost yet. He doesn't know the ghost is there yet. And so he says to the, to the crowd, he's trying to be you know, full of cheer, and he's trying to keep things together, and he says... Here had we now our country's honored roofed were the graced person of our Banquo presence. So he says, we would have all of our, all of our most noble people in all of Scotland would be here if Banquo had been here. Who may I rather challenge for unkindness uh, than pity for mischance. So he's trying to make a joke and saying, mm, I'd like to just kind of uh, um, um, challenge him for being unkind and, and not showing up at our feast. Then I would pity him for, for you know, having a having a, a, a something bad happen that he couldn't he couldn't arrive he's trying to make a joke teasing Banquo for not showing up at his party um, it's a bit feeble and it shows that uh, Banquo is first and foremost in in Macbeth's mind here for which reason is it reason a which is his his guilt and his his, his humane guilt or fear of getting of fleance having gotten away I think it's um, Oh, it's both. I think it's absolutely both. Um, and Ross joins in the, the light teasing of Banquo and says, his absence, sir, lays blame upon his promise. So he promised to be here and he should be here. Or maybe it's not so light. Maybe it's not, maybe it is a bit of a rebuke. Uh, please at your highness, graces with your company, come sit down. Let's, well, let's just read this. This is quite obvious though. Personification. Banquo's ghost is a manifestation of Macbeth's guilt, shame, and fear. Does Cain feel guilt for killing Abel? We don't hear much about it in the traditional story, I don't think, but there's a question for us. Uh, Macbeth looks around the table, and he sees that the table is full because there's a ghost sitting there. Now, if you have to imagine, uh, the, the stagecraft of this scene would be something like, well, you could do it a hundred ways, I suppose, but you know, the audience is here. There's a big, long table. And very often, uh, what I saw at once, so the Royal Shakespeare Company, the... the uh, I'm, I'm Macbeth at the head of the table, um, standing at the head of the table, and Macbeth and the audience is back there, and Banquo sits at the f closest to the stage with his back to the audience and facing Macbeth, who's standing at the head of the at the front of the at the back of the stage, and so uh, it's kind of chilling, you know, when you're in the audience and you see the, just this ghostly, you know, guy come in and just sit down there. Very often, there's a, a, a uh, a trap door and the chair will come up and he'll just be there and then he'll kind of disappear and then he'll come back up again. So there's lots of different ways you can stage it. If, if so you, you just have to kind of imagine it. Uh, the 1979 version that I'm so familiar with is the, and, and in love with is the, uh, they, they don't have, they don't have the ghost at all. They just have Macbeth seeing nothing, which I think maybe makes as much sense because it's all a hallucination anyway. Nobody sees it. Uh, so we have a place reserved for you. Where? I don't see anything. Here, my good Lord. And then, after the Lennox says this, that's when Macbeth, you know, freezes. He says, oh, my God, I see Banquo there. And everyone freaks out. And he says, what's, what's freaking you out, your highness? What, what is it that moves you? And Macbeth accuses everyone. Who has done this? Who's done what? And then he's speaking here to the ghost. And the ghost has blood all over his hair. And he says, you can't say that I did it. Ghost, Banquo, you can't say that I did it. It, of course, is the crime. You can't accuse me. Never shake your gory locks at me. So I guess there's the image of the ghost is just kind of looking straight at, at Macbeth and accusing him. It's the, it's the, uh, uh, it's the, the finger wag uh, for good reason. Um, and he says, don't, don't shake your bloody hair at me. Roth says, gentlemen, stand up. There's something wrong with his highness. His highness is not well. Now, of course, we are waiting for Lady Macbeth to come in and rescue the scene because she's got an ever, she's got an ever watchful eye on her husband who she knows is not very good at this, which kind of begs the question, why on earth would she set him upon this task to begin with? 
lack of self-knowledge, foolishness, et cetera, et cetera. We are the agents of our own destruction. So she says, that's okay, that's okay, guys. Sit, worthy friends. My Lord is often thus and hath been since his youth. So she tries to pass it off. I mean, back in those days, we didn't know anything about, you know, medical conditions. Or we didn't know anything about panic attacks. We didn't know anything about, you know, these kinds of mental illnesses. Um, epilepsy was very, very uh, widely misunderstood, but fairly much accepted, I suppose, because, well, we have evidence from Julius Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar apparently historically did have epilepsy. It was, called, it was called the falling sickness or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, so that was an excuse in Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, um, uh, he had uh, a, a buddy that would come by and stick the, the the stick in his mouth so he wouldn't bite his own tongue and stuff like that. So it, it was understood. You know, epilepsy was understood to be something. Um, so Lady Macbeth tries to pass it off and say it was just 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 this. He has the falling sickness or he has this illness from from youth. Pray you please sit down. It is, uh, the fit is momentary. Upon a thought, he will be well again. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Now, of course, this is the mother hen protecting her young, the mother protecting uh, uh, her her young. Don't look at him. Don't look at him. She's trying to get attention away from him. Go ahead, continue your meal, feed, and regard him not. Then she turns to him and viciously attacks him. Are you a man? Which, of course, is the manhood theme. Uh, and you would think that would make his fit the worse to make him feel even more horrible. But again, these people are ignorant of, you know, how psychology works. And, uh, and he replies in a quite witty way. He says, yes, I am a bold man that dare look on that which may appall the devil, on the thing that might appall the devil that would shock the devil. So she's looking at a ghost that comes back. He's looking at a ghost that comes back, and he says, yes, of course, I am a strong man that can bear to look at that yeah it's true <clears throat> oh proper stuff stuff in shakespeare's day means just a bunch of nonsense we use it as physical stuff but that they meant it kind of mean nonsense uh this is the very painting of your fear this is the air drawn dagger which you said led you to duncan so it's interesting that he actually confided in lady Macbeth. she says you know wife i saw this dagger and it led me to the thing um, i'm not sure what they would have thought this is an interesting task for you if you're interested in this kind of stuff would, would shakespeare's audience have have understood hallucinations to be something more real they were they were superstitious they were very superstitious as i mentioned they believed in witches uh they believed that uh, the devil had little minions they believed in fairies fairies were associated with the uh, you know, that they were the trickster gods that they did believe would come and interfere with people's lives. Perhaps um, they were agents of, of the devil, these minions of the devil. Uh, so they did believe in all this stuff. So they might have believed in something, you know, they might have believed that, yeah, the witches brought the daggers or you really did see a dagger. They, they didn't understand, you know, what, what panic attacks and hallucinations all would have been. So she just says, she tries to brush it off and said, this is just all nonsense. This is just all the painting of your fear. This is just all... Um, you know, you're, you're imagining it. Oh, these flaws and starts and postures to true fear. Well, what I, I have no idea what she means by that. What do you mean impostures to true fear? If what Macbeth is not, if what Macbeth has experienced is not true fear, then there is no such thing as fear because it's exactly what fear is. Well, how would she define true fear? Perhaps, oh no, it, it's obvious. She believes in the true, the true manhood, which would mean if you're facing a bear, or a lion, or another soldier, that's true fear. She doesn't understand the more subtle uh, nuances of, 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 the, of the human experience. Would well become a woman's story. So all of these flaws and starts would be part of a woman's story at a winter's fire told by her grandmother. So again, he's calling her, he's calling him uh, a, a woman. He's calling him, he's saying, she's saying that he is not a man. Shame itself. Why do you make such faces? When all's done, you look but on a chair. You look but on a stool. Fair enough. She's absolutely right. But her haranguing, I don't think, is going to help him snap out of it at all. It's probably going to make things worse. So he's starting to freak out. Perhaps in stage, again, the stagecraft, the ghost is flitting around. You know, it's moving around. So he's looking around the stage. He's saying, look over here. Look, behold, how I say you. He's screaming at it. Then he's, he's trying to compose himself. He says, what care I, you know, but then he's, he's shifting. This, this, this language is here is all broken and, and hectic and, uh, and, and disordered, uh, which, of course, reflects his state of mind. And he talks to the ghost and he says, if you can nod, so the ghost is, you know, you know, doing this to him. If you can nod, go ahead and speak to me. Go ahead. 
Then again, a disjointed thought. He moves on to another thought. So we're, we're jumping all around here. So you can't try to make sense of all this in a fluid, as a fluid argument or anything. It's just all his, his thoughts are bouncing around. He says, if charnel houses and graves must send those that we bury back, our monuments shall be the maws of kites. Now, the general idea of this is charnel houses is where we put the bones. Graves, of course, is a grave. And he says, if the graves are going to send back their dead, then the birds of prey that eat our corpses are going to be eating our corpses. So he's, he's making a comment. Um, Shakespeare just has to fill up. The Shakespeare has to get... Shakespeare has to use words to get these kinds of images of the dead rising and stuff into the audience's head. He has to use more words than just images. Of course, you could have a corpse. You could have a bloody actor come up out of the stage, out of the floor, and have it there. So there's the visualization of it. But remember, Shakespeare's age was a more... Um, it was a, it, it was it, it was it, it appreciated words more and and part of the fun of going there was to hear the description of it like hearing a good story we all love hearing somebody tell us a story if you listen to audiobooks i listen to a lot of audiobooks um, and we love someone reading a good story to us so this is what he's doing he's reading the story to the audience filling in uh, filling in the visuals with 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 beautiful words again she slaps him down what of oh, the ghost vanishes what unmanned in folly have you been un have you lost your manhood in this foolishness and he swears he swears if i stand here i swear by by well I, if i stand here i saw him i swear i saw him five for shame well that's a big one five just means this curse that shows disgust so she's got contempt for him a contemptuous wife contemptuous mother poor macbeth five for shame the chastising mother um, Macbeth says, blood hath been shed ere now in the olden time before ere human statue purged the gentle wheel. So this is actually kind of weird. Let me just explain this a bit. Uh, he's saying that it's, it's, it's a childish kind of complaint. It's kind of this why me complaint. He's saying that, well, everybody's been, you know, murders have happened in the past. Blood has been shed, shed before now. And in the olden days, before humans have civilized the world, before human laws have civilized uh, have brought civilization to the, the savage world. Before that, and even since that, murders have been performed too terrible to hear. And at all those times when the brains were out, the man would die and not come back, and there would be an end. So there's an echo here of this, uh, if, the, if, the, if this act would be the be-all and the end-all here. So it's this childish kind of whining. It says, why, why am I seeing this ghost? Every tons of murders have happened before. Why me? But now they rise again with 20 mortal murders on, that, on their crowns and push us from our stools. But now they're coming back again, so the times are weird. Well, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's a foolish, childish, you know, um, notion to have this, you know, why am I being punished and nobody else has been through the past? You know, he's, he's, he's a fool. This is more strange than the murder was. So this returning of the ghost is more strange than the actual murder was. Well, yeah, fair enough. It's your psychology, buddy. My noble lord, your friends do lack you. So she's trying to pull him back. She's trying to say, guy, you know, you know Macbeth, you know, everyone's watching you. Can you can you kind of get your get your stuff together here? He does come back momentarily. He says, okay, okay, I do forget. I'm sorry. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity, which is nothing to those who know me. So she, he picks up Lady Macbeth's um, <clears throat> argument and says, yeah, it's, it's just a strange uh, weakness that I've had. Uh, perhaps this is a bit of the theme, the, the sickness theme, uh, the corruption of Scotland. Yeah, it's a bit of overthinking, I suppose. Uh, come, love. Come, love and health to all, and then I'll sit down. So he, he gives the cheer, and, and then I'll, I'll sit down. Give me some wine, you know, full, fill full. I drink to the general health, blah, blah, blah. He's raising a cup, and he raises a cup, and again, first and foremost in his mind is his friend Banquo. And again, look at the language. I ask the question always, is, does he sincerely miss Banquo? Does Cain miss Abel? I suspect so. Uh, Ian McKellen and the director of that, that version thought so because they have Ian McKellen wince when he says this. It's a lovely moment too when he says these words. You see, it's the words. It's my my. Remember the analysis: the why a why not b. Why did Shakespeare put these words there? If Macbeth was truly cruel, if Macbeth truly did not regret at the deepest level killing his buddy, then he could have just said, "Cheers to the table and Banquo." Too bad he's not here. 
He could have skipped the dear friend. He could have skipped this whom we miss. But Shakespeare chose to put it in there. And I think Ian McKellen and or the director of that version, they, they, they decided to have Ian McKellen wince. And he just kind of, he, 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 there's a pained expression on his face when he says this. And I, I, I think the play bears it out. Um, or he's just being all flower. Is that being all flower? Or is there sincerity in there? Go ahead, write your essay, one way or the other. And I probably couldn't disagree with you if you disagree with me, because there'd be lots of evidence to show that he's quite cruel. Would he were here? Again, this is the same thing. Why? Would he were here means I wish he were here. That's an old-fashioned way to say I wish. Would he were here? To all and him we thirst. Re repeatedly, repeatedly to Banquo. Doesn't keep Banquo out of his mind. A real, a real, you know, king would, you know, if somebody doesn't show up, a real king would say, yeah, whatever. Yeah, here's, here's to us. Wouldn't even bother mentioning Banquo. But, but again, is he mentioning Banquo because of the guilt or is he mentioning Banquo because he's, he's just simply afraid? Anyway, okay, so our duties and the pledge. So there's the toast, and the ghost comes back again. And he says, go away, avaunt, and quit my sight. Let the earth hide thee. Go back into your grave. Thy bones are marrowless. You have no marrow in your bones. Thy blood is cold. Thou hast no speculation in your eyes. You can't see with your eyes, which thou, which thou dost glare with. Lovely word. Choice. There's the Cain and Abel thing. Uh, by his mere presence, Abel is a judgment on Cain. Cain knows that he's inferior to Abel's efforts, to Abel's character, and just by being alive, Abel is a judgment on Cain. So here it is, judgmental glare of the ideal. Here's those eyes. Macbeth is the, uh, Banquo is the better man, and just looking at, it's, a, it's an accusation. Just looking at Macbeth is an accusation. So the, the focus on the glare, can't stand the glare, the accusatory glare. Lady Macbeth steps in again, and she tries to cover up with the old epilepsy thing or whatever the hell it was. Uh, think of this, good peers, as but a thing of custom. It happens all the time. Tis no other. Only it spoils the pleasure of the time. She says, but but I'm, I'm sorry that it, it ruins our party. Great line here, and absolutely true. What man dare I dare? Lovely statement, lovely statement. Approach thou like the rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros, the her can bear the tiger, the Asian tiger. Take any shape but that. Take any shape, take any physical shape except the psychological accusation. I can't handle that. I can't handle that pressure. And if you take any of these physical shapes, my nerves would be firm and they should never tremble. Uh, it's true that he, he's a, he's a great he's a he's a he's a good man he's a he's a good man in that he can defend the weak he can defend us against tigers and whatever the hell a rhinoceros would be doing in Scotland I don't know, um, but psychologically he can't handle this or be alive again he says to Banquo and dare me to the desert with thy sword now here we get to the cruelty, not such a good man go ahead Banquo come up and let's you and I fight it out with a sword and I can handle it but I can't handle your accusations. If trembling I then inhabit, protest me the baby of a girl. If, faced with the tiger, faced with you hand to hand, if I tremble then, I am the girl. Unmanned. Hence, horrible shadow. He can't handle it. Unreal mockery, hence. He's trying to shuffle it off as being unreal. Banquo's ghost vanishes. Why so, being gone, I am a man again. So, the ghost is gone, and Macbeth has, Macbeth's manhood has returned. It's all done. The party's over. All the guys are just staring at him saying, what's going on here? Should I be, you know, planning a long vacation to the south of France at this moment? Scotland doesn't seem to be in very good hands. You have displaced the mirth, broke the good meeting with your, your crazy disorder. And he keeps dwelling on this. He says, of course, can such things be and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? He says... You know, the fits come like a clear sky and the cloud comes over and that's the craziness and the cloud disappears, comes and disappears. And he says, can, can, and he asks everyone, he says, how can I not freak out at this? How can I not approach this with special wonder? Uh, you make me strange 
even to the disposition, disposition that I owe, when now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine are blanched with fear. And he, he, Macbeth, in turn, is amazed at everybody else that how can you look at this stuff and keep the redness of your cheeks when mine are made white and pale with fear? So Macbeth wonders how everyone else can look at the ghost and not panic. But of course, you know, but he's getting close. This is what's happening here. He's getting close to actually saying, how can you look on those sights? And then Ross picks it up and he says, well, what sights do you see? And of course, Lady Macbeth, the ever watchful mother hen is like, I pray you speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him. Don't ask him any more questions. She's terrified that he's going to reveal that, you know, he sees the ghost of Banquo, in which case, when it's revealed that Banquo is dead, everyone will know that Macbeth killed him. At once, good night. Stand not on the order of your going, but go at once. Don't make don't make formal don't make your formal good good nights to the king. Just get the hell out of here. Good night and better health to his majesty. They all leave. A kind good night to all. Everyone's there but Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. And now they're just kinda left panting. The, they're they're in the ball they're in the the banquet room and there's dishes and wine all over the place and cold food getting cold and it's just it's just a total nightmare. Um, some lovely poetry here. It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. I've mentioned that before. That's the necessary paranoia of the tyrant. That's the retribution. Blood will have blood. Uh, a little bit of weirdness here. A bit of his fear. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augurs and understood relations have, by maggot pies and chuffs and rooks, brought forth the secret as blood of man. So Macbeth uh, is, is afraid of being revealed here by uh, the sightseers, the soothsayers, the future seers. Um, back in the old days, you know, the uh, consult the entrails. Have you heard that expression? Uh, the ancient Romans, for example, they had soothsayers to see the future, and they would... If, if, if a general wanted to know whether we should attack now or tomorrow, they would consult the soothsayer and they would rip open the guts of a lamb or something and rummage around in the entrails. And by divining the entrails, he would determine what the best course of action would be. Um, so Macbeth is kind of, there's that kind of thing. He says, you know, soothsayers can read nature, can read the magpies, can read the chuffs as a kind of bird and read the rooks, which is a kind of crow, and they can read the behavior of them and determine the secret blood of man. So here's Macbeth a little bit afraid of, of being found out. And he suspects perhaps that, uh, that somebody is trying to, is, somebody has shown this ghost to him uh, in order to reveal his guilt. So again, spooky stuff. Um, Remember, I've mentioned before that the Shakespeare's audience was superstitious. They did believe in these things. Uh, it's a pre, more or less pre-scientific age. Uh, what is the night? What time is it? It's almost at odds with morning. Which is which? You can't really tell. It's twilight. Again, there's that equivocation thing. We don't know if it's A. We don't know if it's B. Motif. How stayest thou? Macduff denies his person at our great bidding. Now his fear returns. Macduff didn't show up at the banquet. That's telling, and Macbeth notices the tyrant's paranoia, the endless cycle of violence. He's going to fear everyone because he knows it's coming for him. The daggers are coming for him. Uh, Macduff didn't show up, and he and actually Macbeth is right to fear because Macduff is the guy that's going to come back and get his uh, and 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 set things right. Did you officially send for Macduff? And he says, "Well, indirectly, but I will send. I will find out what's going on." There's not a one of them, there's not a thane in Scotland that doesn't have a, a, a servant feed, a paid servant. So he's got spies. This is the tyrant's paranoia, Stalin, et cetera, et cetera. This is Macbeth's. Uh, Macbeth's was, I, I've, I, I, as I mentioned, I've, I, I focus on the psychology, the psychological genius of Shakespeare. But psychological genius is also political genius because politics is all psychology. I mentioned before that the politics of a nation is just a, a grand, grander expression of the psychology of each individual within that nation. Um, <clears throat> I will tomorrow, and betimes I will, to the weird sisters. So now he is, he says to his wife that, okay, I'm, 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 I'm all in here. For now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. I'm going to go as far as I have to go to find out what's going on here. For my own good, I'm going to preserve myself. All else will take second place. All causes shall give way for my own preservation. There's the tyrant. There's the tyrant. That's a definition of, of tyranny, actually. 
the world can be damned. I'm going to preserve myself. So he says, I'm going to go to the Weird Sisters, actually. So this is actually, this is pretty significant um, in the course of the play. There's the descent. We talked about the descent, like Lord of the Flies. This is a descent uh, plot. Uh, the Peripatia will be complete. Macbeth will enter the witch's realm, and the, uh, uh, which will signal uh, complete alignment with the powers of darkness and evil. And once we get to that scene, it's, it's, uh, it's when he meets the witches, it's absolutely, it's, it's, it's a chilling bit of, of, uh, of storytelling. Um, I am in blood, some beautiful poetry here. And it's this first echo, remember our echo, this, it's, it's, we're building up now to the great existential crisis that Macbeth has in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the, the action, there's the climax. There's also the psychological climax. And the psychological climax comes in the beautiful, beautiful poem later on, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. This beautiful, despairing, probably the greatest poem ever written about existential despair. Uh, and we, we, we get a little hint of it here, that, that emotional climax, the psychological climax. And he says here, I am in blood stepped so in so far should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go or as go forward. Uh, it's the old joke. Um, you've heard um, uh, the joke about, you know, the guy trying to swim the English Channel. He gets halfway there, he gets tired and turns back. So he fails. So there's the joke. Why not just keep going? It's that. So he, he knows that he's stepped in so far that he doesn't care anymore. I'm just, you know, Forget it. I'm going to go forward. Damn it. Damn it all. Damn the torpedoes, if that's what that is. I'm going to just go for it because going back and try to try to correct these mistakes are as tedious. Well, this is the thing that, that interests me. This is my why A, why not B. Why does Shakespeare have that word tedious in there? Just like we asked about why does he focus on my dear friend Banquo up here? They're not mistakes. They're there because they, they signal something that's happening. Um, it's the existential despair that Macbeth is feeling. This alienation from the self leads to a sense of meaninglessness. And that's what I read in the word tedious. Everything already we're not even we're not even at the crest yet. He hasn't even maxed out on evil, and it's the life is meaningless for him. He's not enjoying anything, anything. Uh, very very sad. Uh, as go or strange things I have in head that will to hand which must be acted before they may be scanned. So he 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 hints to Lady Macbeth what he's got to do. He's got some some evil things to do in his head. Here's the thought versus action theme. Uh, that will to hand. The hand is the symbol of action. The head, of course, is the th symbol of the thought. Getting from the thought to the action is not easy, uh, as you'll see in Hamlet, if and when you get there. Uh, so he tells me, Lady Macbeth, I've got some evil stuff to do, which I have to do before I think about them. Now that's significant as well. He doesn't want to think about them. Again, I'm going to argue that he's morally aware he's not the man for this job he doesn't even i, I don't i just gotta do it just gotta just do it do it do it do it do it without thinking about it he can't stand his own thoughts he can't stand being cribbed and cabined in his own mind um he, he's 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 ruined himself you lack the nature of all seas of all natures you lack the season of all natures sleep there we go again there's the motif sleep as healer sleep as innocence uh the nature versus nurture theme and you lack the uh, preservative uh there's the preservative the season like salt is a preservative of a nature come will to sleep my strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that wants hard use we are but young indeed lovely finale uh, that's that's a false friend it means lax uh, to lack We'll go to sleep. My strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear. So we're newbies. Basically, he's saying here, we're just newbies in this murder business and we lack experience. We lack practice in the murder game. But there's a signal here that we, we've we just begun. We're going to commit more murders. We are but young indeed. We are but young in action. Our actions are still young. We've got more bloody actions to do. It's chilling. Beautiful language, but of course, chilling. Okay, so that, like I said, that was one of the one of the major crests in these uh, these climactic waves, and uh, it's very very tense. It was one of the most intense scenes in the whole play. Um, um, the other big crest being when they 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 actually go in and kill Duncan. This is the next big crest, uh, and as we've seen with that other crest, the crests that follow are uh, not no, no the, the 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 troughs that follow are the uh, 
or, or downtime, downtime. Uh, this is a weird one. So there's two downtime themes coming up, uh, scenes coming up, as we'll discuss um, next time.